The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. Nothing worse than the second you fire up your video and bam, it freezes. <laughs> well, better than two weeks ago and we didn't even uh, have access to the right buttons. So, this is Martin Sobretti. I am the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation and we're here for another broadcast of Chalcedon Q&A, Meet of the Word, where I get to uh, answer questions, some of them sent in advance, some of them live, working without a net. And today is July 8th, 2018. We missed you all last week. One of the questions that we have in, uh, was designed to uh, be pre presented on July 1st because it talks about something in the future, 4th of July, which now is in the past. But we'll hit the question anyway. Uh, as soon as I get word from uh, ground control that uh, we are connected, we'll go ahead and uh, move forward with the first questions. Uh, the first two questions were interesting because they were a result of listening to Rush's lecture in the Eschatology series, Eschatology and a Prayer. Hey, Shelby, good to have you with us. Rory, thumbs up to you as well. <laughs> Waving and stuff. All sorts of wonderful things to uh, encourage the man who's putting this together. So, um, I haven't heard from Ground Control yet. Let's see if uh, we're connected, because once we're connected, we can go ahead and proceed with the questions. By the way, if you were, did not get a chance to um, go live with the Book of the Month Club that was presented last week, uh, they, we, we swapped out because of a medical issue. Uh, the original uh, host, with Charles Roberts, would have done that, but uh, uh, Steve Macias uh, came in and stepped in and did a fantastic job. Hey, greetings, Doug. Aha, Andrea's with us. As soon as Andrea tells us that we're good, then uh, I'll go ahead and um, proceed with the uh, actual questions. But uh, I believe that it's uh, now posted. I got noticed that the uh, last week's Book of the Month Club on um, the uh, it, that Steve Macias inter did is now available, and you can go ahead and uh, dig into it and go walk through it. It's really excellent. Uh, so, how are we doing, Ground Control? Oh, by the way, uh, August 6th, I will be uh, conducting the next Book of the Month Club broadcast, which will be on the mythology of science. Interestingly enough, August 6th, 1945, is when the nuclear atomic bomb was dropped on uh, Hiroshima. We are live now. That's good. So kind of an interesting choice of date to talk about science and its effect in its mythologies on the day when so many people died in one split second and many others suffered thereafter. Uh, and where the and the justification for those events. So, all right, here are the first questions that came in online, and uh, let's proceed. Uh, Rush makes the statement in the Q and A of the Eschatology series that John Calvin, despite it being attributed to him, did not believe in limited atonement, although Rush Dooney himself did. In doing some research on the topic, there appears to be varying opinions on this point about Calvin's views. Please comment. So uh, I sent a link to Ground Control uh, from a Puritan mind, and it actually contains a lot of the information about the difference of opinion and how both sides are trying to grab uh, Calvin uh, as an advocate for their position, either for limited atonement, particularism, or universal atonement, uh, more of an Arminian position. So if Ground Control can go ahead and post that link, then folks who want to dig into this question, there it is, uh, can see what uh, Dr. Roger Nicole had to say on it. It's very interesting uh, because there was, in fact, disputes going back and forth. Um, Kendall all but appropriated uh, Calvin for the side of the Universalists, 
then Paul Helm goes in and, and knocks him for a loop, if you will. So the battle goes back and forth, back and forth on this exact point. Uh, and Nicole ends up ruling in favor of uh, particular atonement, limited atonement, being Calvin's position, that there's uh, some ambiguities and uh, misconstruing of his views. Now, let's ask this question, why are we so interested in Calvin's position? It's because a lot of people want to say, I'm with Calvin. Uh, in other words, we, uh, I'm with Apollos, I'm with Paul, I'm with Cephas kind of problem. And so, too, we want to be able to drop names. And this propensity to drop names is a hazard in theology, and, it, and it's a dangerous hazard. And I don't think there's an easy way around it, uh, because it's what uh, we tend to do because we want to uh, argue from some level of authority. And ironically, this creates a, no, a known logical fallacy. You know, it's a fallacy, uh, ad vericundium fallacy, a false appeal to authority. So regardless of what Calvin had to say, whether it was right or wrong, the question really is, what does God say, not what Calvin says, uh, or what this confession says? You know, all these other things are secondary sources and should not be confused with the canonical scriptures uh, as they've been delivered by God to us. So it's not the word of man that should matter and guide, it's the word of God that should guide. Uh, and if we should happen to confuse the two, because the word of man is useful, but if we confuse the two, then we get into trouble. So if we're dropping names, that means that we're citing different authorities and saying, therefore, we are. the very first thing that comes to mind in Scripture, if you think about it, there was a point in time when Ahab had 400 prophets of God telling him it was safe to go into battle, and only one said different. Micaiah said different. says, if you come back alive, God hasn't spoken by me. And Ahab did not come back alive from the battle. So the important point to note is it matters only what God says, ultimately. Uh, we need to realize that men are men, and the uh, are humanum est errare, as the saying goes, it is to, to err is human. And so we are not perfect. We see through a glass darkly. God sees everything crystal clear. And so God's verdict on this question of limited atonement would be the one to go for. Now, if it happens to be Calvin's position or Rushton's position, that's a fantastic thing. But it should be realized that the original truth is in God and his counsels. Now, one of the reasons that this came up is interesting to me, is that they said, well, look what Calvin had to say about First um, John 2, 2, about the propitiation, not just for uh, us, but for the whole world, uh, the notion of a worldwide propitiation. There is a reason that when Chalcedon published this anthology called Thine is the Kingdom, and I believe it's also available for free online uh, to view if you don't own a copy. Uh, you can review it. I agree with that, Michael. If you review that book, we actually have republished, probably because it was in the public domain by this time, uh, Warfield's view of uh, uh, 1 John 2.2, 2, the propitiation for the whole world. What does this phrase mean in John? And is he describing a, a notion of a limited atonement or a universal atonement? And Warfield, uh, as you know, is in the line of succession from Calvin. Uh, the Reform succession takes us from Calvin into the next century and then finally to the founding of Princeton before it fell away in the early 20th century, um, to, to the Hodge, uh, from Alexander to Hodge, and finally to Warfield. And so we had a growth in understanding of these passages, and Warfield unpacks it properly and explains what is going on there, that in fact... Uh, in John's mind, he is contrasting the early beginnings of the church and its work and the fantastic ending of it, that they, we had a small flock, maybe just 12 disciples at one time, or 500 on Ascension Day and 3,000 on Pentecost, but ultimately it'll expand, and so therefore it's not just a small provincial atonement and propitiation that John is speaking of, but a worldwide one in its ultimate effect. So it's a difference in time between the early beginnings and the colossal ending of the church era, uh, when no man need teach his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know the Lord from the least of the greatest. So where the time will come when, in fact, the propitiation of Christ covers everyone who's then living. And that is actually, literally, was uh, the case. So we look at what's known as the protensive view throughout time, throughout history. It's not just extension, it's protension. And, and uh, certainly... This was the case, uh, far-reaching future vision for John, 
because uh, in the uh, very same epistle, just a few, six verses later, 1 John 2, 8, he says this, he says, the, uh, the darkness is passing away and the true light is shining already. Uh, and as Warfield points out, that took some small, you know, no small measure of faith to look at on all the masses of heathen darkness in Asia Minor, the church surrounded by it and saying the darkness is passing away. And the true light is shining already. And the darkness will pass away and be driven away until you know, we, the fullness of day comes. That's why Christ is the bright and morning star heralding the coming of the Son of Righteousness, rising with healing in his wings, as laid out in Malachi 4.2. So it's important to, if you're not familiar with that exposition of First John 2.2, 2, uh, go ahead and look it up in Diana's a Kingdom. I see that uh, uh, Ground Control has posted it for us. Thank you, Ground Control. Always super people to work with. Uh, and having my back, which is important when I work without a net. That's <laughs> someone's watching my back. And not with a gun, but with uh, assistance. And uh, you can review what Warfield had to say on that exact point. Uh, and that explains the, where Calvin might have been a little antsy about trying to make a commitment. He didn't himself resolve the problem to his own satisfaction, but it was resolved later, so that's good to know. Uh, because there is this contrast between the early beginnings and the fantastic ending, uh, what everything is tending toward and what everything is moving toward. And that's actually going to come into play uh, in some of the other questions that uh, came up. Second question. In the same lecture on eschatology and prayer, Rashtuni talks about not destroying existing civil order in order to right wrongs. In other words, he speaks against anarchy. Please discuss the balance between working to, ex to change existing humanistic orders and not moving into revolution or anarchy. Well, that's the deal, is that the leaven is thrown into the lump of flour, three whole measures of meal, and it doesn't destroy the leaven, it transforms it. And so that's the point, is that the work of the Holy Spirit through... Uh, the people of God is to become salt, to become transformative light, to penetrate the darkness, and leaven penetrates all through whole measures of meal. So it's that you're going to not destroy, say, the Roman Empire, but transform the Roman Empire. Uh, in that sense, part of it will have to die because it is a, uh, built on sand. But in the process of the transformation, pieces and pieces of it at a decentralized level are being put back on the rock and therefore can weather the storms of time and to the extent that you build on the rock, you can weather the storms for a long time. Byzantium for 10 centuries before they finally decided to inflate the currency and just depart from biblical law. And then, of course, their end was written in, in, the, in history for that point. So, yeah, that's the whole point is that the notion of uh, let's tear everything apart and destroy it. Uh, it's Satan who is the destroyer. Uh, Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer. That is not the, the Christian position at all. It's rather that we are there to transform. Uh, and and uh, so it's really a renewal. There's a difference between two words for new in the Greek, neos and kainos. Uh, neos is brand spanking new, and kainos kind of like renewed, brand new, repristinated, made pristine again, uh, restored to its original purpose, if you will. It's a restoration that's in view. Uh, you can even term it a restitution, the restitution of all things. And a restitution of something is not its destruction, it's its putting put, put on a proper uh, foundation at long last. That's what it's all about. Super CISO Roberts, hello to you too. I know you uh, tune in from far away. So again, Rashtuni says there's a right way to approach these issues tactically. And we don't want to use the enemy's tactics. That'll come back upon us because then... Uh, we are using weapons of the flesh, which were warned against in Second Corinthians uh, 10, verse 4 and 5. We are not to use them. We are to use strong weapons, spiritual weapons, uh, that work at the mental level, if you will, the idea of, uh, level of ideas, of concepts, of culture, being transformed by the incoming of the Christ and biblical prerogatives and uh, biblical concepts uh, being re-injected back into society and people through the Holy Spirit uh, being quickened to them, adopting them, and praising them. You know, the uh, law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It can convert a lot of things more than just the soul. It actually transforms societies. And we can see this willingness to be transformed in Isaiah 42, verse 4 and 5, where it says the islands are waiting for God's law. They desperately need it, and they know it, and they're asking for it. And 
what do too many missionaries do? Give them something other than the law of God. Uh, they give them a very truncated, chopped up gospel message rather than the whole counsel of God. This gets you in trouble because as uh, warned by St. Paul, he says, I am guiltless of the blood of all men because I have not shunned to proclaim unto you the whole counsel of God. And that requires all of Scripture being applied uh, to the extent that it's applicable. And it is applicable uh, in almost every single case. Uh, so we do no favors to ourselves or our culture or those who are trying to assist if uh, they're asking for bread and we give them stone. If they ask for fish and we give them a serpent. And uh, essentially, if we don't give them the whole counsel of God, that's what we're doing. We need to be giving them everything that God's word speaks to that has reference to their needs, their problems, the solutions that they need are found in the Word of God, but they are not just be saved and you're good. It's be saved and then the rest of the Great Commission, right? Teaching them all things whatsoever thou hast commanded. All things that God has commanded need to be known to us, and we are to walk in them. So, uh, additional questions. I have uh, three more that came in, and then uh, two finally that popped up that Ford Schwartz asked. So here's some additional questions. Is the concept of walking by faith rather than by sight in line with the idea to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Uh, in the not fully sanctified life, is this even a reality? So, obviously everyone can have a crisis of faith. Uh, John the Baptist wasn't sure at one point. He sent his messengers to say, are you the Christ or are we to look, look for another? Now, it wasn't saying that he was faithless that no Christ would come. He says, are you the right guy? Or do we look for another? His faith in a, a Messiah that God promised, and the promise of God had not yet fallen short. But where the Christ was the one, even though he had went through the trouble of baptizing him and saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him, now he wasn't so sure. He says, you know, I'm sitting here in prison, and things are looking bad, and yet the Messiah is walking around, uh, supposedly, are you the right one? You know, am I, is my faith misplaced? Did I make a mistake? And then Jesus explains, uh, sends the message back, you know, that the blind receive their sight, etc., etc. Uh, and, and this is all that's necessary to indicate yes, yes. So a failure of faith is easy, but remember he was even then saying, I still will look for another Messiah if you're not the one. So it was more a matter that he was going to pull in his horns and say, I'm going to stick with the scripture, I'm going to stick with what God promised. This is kind of where Job himself was, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So it's, that's a very difficult growth for the Christian to get to the point where even his life uh, is he's willing to forfeit that for the sake of Christ, uh, you know, like Polycarp uh, did you know, when he submitted to the execution rather than renounce Christ. So also to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is an important phrase. It appears here, obviously, in the... Uh, passage, uh, a quotation from uh, Matthew 4, 4, and it is uh, clearly quoted from Deuteronomy. But here's the, the issue, is that too many Christians believe that they do not have to um, walk according to uh, uh, and live according to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, out of the mouth of God. Rather, we believe we should can live by some of them, and that the decision between which some to obey and which some not to live by it's up to us. It's a democratic choice, and we're free to choose, and, that, and God has to uh, rubber stamp that decision. And that is a very dangerous position to take. Rather, uh, we're to walk by every word that proceeds by the mouth of God. This speaks again to what I just said before when Paul says, I have not uh, failed to proclaim unto you the whole counsel of God. And that is crystal clear, uh, is that it's not... And this actually is what people get in trouble. That's why I think jot and tittle, having every jot and tittle brought to bear prevents mistakes, prevents errors, prevents sins, prevents catastrophes. If you're applying the entire word of God, then you're not likely to make a mistake. But if you're um, picking and choosing and playing the old smorgasbord game, a buffet kind of style of Christianity, uh, then you will ignore qualifications and things that are very, very important that will then set in motion a different understanding of the scripture and a different application of it and a different way of life as a consequence. So when the whole counsel of God is present, every word of God is present, we're in good shape. This is actually what the, the devil was doing with Christ, was cherry-picking some things. Uh, here's a verse that says this, here's a verse that says that. You know, command these stones be made bread, for example. Um, throw yourself down from the temple, and, and, and God was going to do this, etc. So Christ, therefore, each time is 
supplementing or rather taking the companion doctrine that balances what the devil is putting out there uh, that's unbalanced because it's a partial quotation. Even in the Garden of Eden, there was partial quotation uh, in the way that the, uh, the serpent presented things to Eve. It was not quite accurate. And so the whole counsel of God, the, uh, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, is the key to us. And it was given to us as more valuable to, than bread. The psalmist says, more valuable than gold, yea, much fine gold. And so if our attitude toward the law of God, and actually the whole counsel of God, which means all of it, gospel and law together, uh, it is not to treat it as gold and more valuable than gold, uh, then we will discount its value, and our lives will reflect that fact that we've chosen to build on sand. And when the storms of life come and they are inevitable, uh, great will be the fall of our houses, and we have no one ourselves to blame. We can look in the mirror and say, I did not walk according to the will of God that revealed in Scripture. I made my own decisions. I rewrote things in my head and said, that's what I'm going to walk by. And uh, I'm a really bad God because I couldn't pull off the blessings that were supposed to follow my uh, unilateral course. Um, I'll get to that question uh so once we uh, finish these, but uh, I will come back to that. Thanks for posing a, a challenge to us. And see if we can't uh, unpack that question, which is an interesting one that he just uh, posted on the feed here. So he says, in a not fully sanctified life, is this even a reality? Well, the point is, where are you headed? What direction are you going? Uh, it is certainly that, 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 there is nothing that we do that is not affected by the fact that we are regenerated sinners and that sin nature, that there's that defect in everything we do is still present. And yet Christ makes up the gap for us. So it really matters as that what direction we're headed. Uh, that's the whole notion of metanoia, repentance, is to change in direction. So the fundamental direction we're headed in is according to the law of God, according to the word of God, and walking by faith and not by sight. By the way, the, the sight issue is, I am going to, uh, if the Word of God says one thing and my senses tell me something else or Fox News tells me something else or CNL tells me something else or my pastor tells me something different than the Word of God says or uh, then I have to make a decision which is the truth. And the calling is to follow God no matter what. And the Word of Man and the walking by sight, uh, see this is where Abraham is put up as an example for all of us. He did not consider his own body, now dead, as he said, you know, incapable of bringing forth children, uh, or the fact that Sarah, Sarai was uh, 90 years old. Uh, but he did not stagger at the promises of God, but was strong in faith to believe all that God promised. So it's a matter of considering uh, the circumstances around you as compared to what God's promises are. All of God's promises are a yea and amen. Uh, Bonson fabulously put it this way. He said, you know, the fact that uh, it, it, they say, well, where's this golden age that post millennialists talk about? And he says, so well, the fact that uh, such an age has not arrived is no more significant than the fact that cr then, uh, Christ's return has not occurred. You know, that hasn't happened yet either. Uh, so why should we, you know, he said, this is a reductio ad absurdum, he says. It has to be dealt with. It must be confronted. The fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't matter because it's projected to happen, just like the second coming of Christ is, uh, at the, to close history, is also a certainty. So the same objection of the one would be the objection of the other. That is, has not yet happened. It's simply that now you're ground, grounding your decision-making in your what you see by sight and not by what God affirms. And often God calls things that are not as though they were, as scripture makes clear, and so we have a mighty God to whom nothing is impossible, as Jesus informs us. And so, uh, and Robert Haldane made this point when he was commenting on Romans 11 about the conversion of the entire world, first all the Gentiles and then all the Jews. And he says, well, with God, nothing's impossible, including this. Uh, and therefore, there's no, and there's no scripture of objection to it from other corners. Therefore, there's no reason to not accept that passage literally in the full sense of the words. So that's what happens, is that if you start to walk by sight, you start to use what's known as newspaper exegesis in dealing with Scripture, and you're inclined then to say, well, I'm going not, not to trust uh, these faithful Christians from years past. I'm going to trust CNN and the, these news guys and all the people with the pessimistic forecasts of doom, uh, the other ones that are right, and we might as well get in and... and uh, uh, go to grow to ground, things like that. 
So uh, the upshot is that when you walk by sight, you are no longer going to be blessed because you're no longer walking by faith. Uh, you're no longer trusting God. And consequently, you put your trust in man, in what men do. And this is a snare, right? Curses the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his arm is pronounced as a curse. And this is in Jeremiah 17, 5. So as a curse to be taken uh, very seriously. It's what happens when you start to walk by sight and not trust in God by walking by faith. You are now trusting in the word of man, and there's a curse attached to that. I don't think you want to go there. I do not want to go there. And if it makes you the laughing stock to trust in God, be the laughing stock. I'm sure Noah was the laughing stock for quite some time during the construction of the ark. It was the safer place to be, but to be the laughing stock than the ones laughing. Next question came up. Justice seems to work best, and biblically, on the most local of levels, family, church, community. In his third volume of Institutes, Rush Duny talks about the justice of the peace, and how often the office was not filled by a lawyer, but by someone who was versed in biblical law. Do you think it feasible to establish such an office unofficially? Well, it certainly can be established unofficially, insofar as people will gravitate to uh, individuals who show wisdom and uh, uh, knowledge of, of law and justice. If you want to seek that in your culture, then, of course, people will certainly gravitate uh, to those who uh, are willing to be mighty in the scriptures and to bring them to bear on the culture that they're in. So uh, a restoration of the notion of the justice of the peace, I think, is a fantastic concept. Notice that the, um, the concept behind it is it's not a lawyer, but rather someone versed in biblical law. Therefore, someone who can apply the law of God, which is a salve, it's the balm of Gilead. Everything that God brings to bear is a healing word. It, it uh, literally uh, transforms everything that it applies to. Uh, it's, you see this notion with respect to the living waters coming out of the side of the temple wall in the image given in Ezekiel 47. And it becomes, uh, transforms everything that it touches. Every, whichever way the water it touches, it, it comes to life, see? So the same thing, the Word of God is the same thing. It transforms everything. It's like living waters, and the Word of God is like that. And so our problem in our culture, of course, is that we want the, prefer the Word of man over the Word of God, and you're going to be cursed as a result of that. It's built into the creation, as Jeremiah 17, 5 informs us. But not as feasible, it's a great idea. Now, interesting, the last word is unofficially. Uh, there's such a thing as an official justice of the peace. I know here in the county I live in, uh, Williamson's, Williamson County in Texas, the justice of the peace has many different functions, including um, when someone passes away, that's the one who visits and uh, determines what the cause of death was, etc., and sees to the bureaucratic paperwork related to uh, the filing of the death certificates and things like that. I'm sure that's not a fun thing for them to do, but they are making note of these, and that's an official government function for them. But making it an unofficial function is an interesting thing because sometimes it actually has more intrinsic authority than it would have otherwise. You can almost see this in the uh, Ananias Caiaphas uh, axis, I call it, in Scripture. Uh, one was officially in authority and the other was not, but was related and had higher um, esteem in the minds of the people because of his uh, age and his... Um, in other words, some people just have authority even if it's not on the name tag or on the t uh, door sign. And this is the case there. In this case, both of them were bad news for Israel. Nonetheless, it just shows that you can invest authority in the wrong people and you pay a price for it because they should have been able to find uh, the law of God at the lip of the priest, as this is laid out in Malachi, and they could not. Please discuss the implication of the fact that the holiday we will celebrate this Wednesday, which was the last Wednesday, 4th of July, was not a revolution in any real sense, but rather a war for independence, and why this distinction matters. Well, of course, everyone wants to grab this event and... Uh, exploit it for their own purposes, their own political ends. Uh, and so it's called uh, appropriation, political appropriation. So uh, that way, you, if you are, say, anti-American in your propensities and your inclinations, 
and uh, you wanted to be a law and order person, you would say, well, of course, the American Revolution was uh, a rebellious, lawless act, and no Christian should have supported it, say. And then if you flip it on the other side, you say, well, the acts of uh, um, the king and parliament on the other side of the Atlantic, those were the lawless acts, and this was a conservative counter-revolution in the sense that we were preserving what was rightfully ours to have and according to our own charters and protecting that which was being attacked, revolutionary from the other side. So who was the revolutionary becomes the question. This was such an important point in the 80s that the Journal of Christian Reconstruction, might have been the late 70s, but nonetheless, same time period, uh, during the first 10-year run of the Journal of Christian Reconstruction, one of the symposiums was on the American Revolution, just to finally set uh, uh, and make a stand on the fact that it was not a lawless rebellion as, um, it might have been Presbyterian, like the George III thought, but nonetheless, it was not a lawless rebellion. It rather was premised on certain things uh, that gave it a basis in biblical justice to proceed. And that's where the, the point is taken. The thing that really gets interesting to me is that the amounts of taxation that they objected to and control, uh, we routinely accept hundreds and thousands of times more intense tyranny today without blinking at it, than they were willing to tolerate. You know, the idea of an uh, infinitesimal tax on tea, uh, went, they went ballistic, and we accept massive taxations, and not, not, a, not a shudder, not a thought. Keep it coming. So when they were far less involved in being slavish in their character than we are, and when you uh, are born a slave and become a slave, it's very hard to work your way out of that mindset. And really, that's the idea. You actually have to work your way out of slavery. Uh, it just is not a snap of the fingers or, at least of all, um, some kind of violent overthrow. Thank you for that, Ground Control. We actually have access to that, the Symposium on Christianity and the American Revolution. I think uh, all the articles there uh, basically move along the same basic direction, is that this was a conservative counter-revolution. In other words, the true revolution was actually over on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, and we were basically protecting uh, those that we were sworn to protect from the effects of it. So, in cons in cons uh, which was consistent with all the um, charters of the colonies to start with, which were at the time sanctioned. And to, interestingly enough, I was thinking, it, was, it was even in the, uh, the Weekly Standard made a commentary on this point last week, that there were quite a few people in um, Parliament who said, you know, fighting the Americans is a bad idea because we need them as trade partners. Uh, and so to militate against them, and literally to militate against them, uh, is, uh, is bad for business, among other things. Uh, it's bad faith on our part, and uh, we're not going to have nearly the productivity we would have if we let them function according to the charters that they originally had. In fact, we're going to go from the frying pan into the fire. So this this, this um, dispute as to the nature of the American Revolution persists to this day and is still, I would say, poisoned by political exploitation on all sides of the spectrum. Everyone wants to use these guys, and uh, if you're pro-American, they're heroes. You have hagiographies written up about the Founding Fathers, and if you're uh, very anti-American and multicultural uh, to a fault, you're going to see them as all robber barons. And uh, there's not going to be much peace between these two points of view, nor I imagine should there be. All right, Ford Schwartz had posed two questions. There's really one question because he gives an example uh, in the second paragraph. It seems clear from a Reconstructionist perspective that all creation, including men, benefit from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Does not this fact undercut and bring light to the limited versus universal atonement debate? For example, even the worst of men will have been able to sin less fully than they may otherwise have fallen to. Otherwise, while perhaps not heaven-bound, yet enjoying the benefits of a Christian-influenced culture while they walked on earth. So what we're really talking about is that there is a, um, a ripple effect from the gospel and the values that are being inculcated into the culture, and the changes in the culture, where even the, um, those who are unregenerate gain a benefit, a temporal benefit, that is a worldly benefit from it. 
uh, and as does the, na- the creation itself. So everything benefits from the coming of Christ. And Jesus deals with this question, and it's called the common grace question, in respect to God's senses rain upon the just and the unjust, and the sunlight shines on both. Now, between them, one is going to be held more accountable for the fact that they receive these blessings, and whether they return to God, except in gratitude, this is laid out in Romans 1, that they denied the God, and neither were they grateful for all these benefits that were uh, given to them. So the gospel does have a transforming effect, not only on the Christians, but even around the Christian. This can have both an evangelistic effect, and it can also have a forensic effect. That is, it it calls... Uh, attention to man's rebellion against God, that he receives these good things and still turns his nose up at the God who gave them. In other words, that ingratitude element that's mentioned in, so prominently in Romans 1. So men's uh, relationship to God is at stake in all of this and cannot be sidestepped. Uh, we can talk big about, as atheists saying, you know, we, there is no God, is the one they're offend. And, of course, the funny line is, one, there is no God, and two, I hate him. So you can't have it both ways, <laughs> ironically. So the, the rebellion of, of man against God uh, is restrained. We mentioned this several uh, weeks ago about that fascinating verse in Psalm 76.10. Uh, the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the residue of wrath thou shalt restrain. In other words, that the uh, effect of the law of God is to restrain evil. And when evil is restrained then certain things are free to propagate throughout a culture. Productivity, blessings, sometimes even uh, toward the close of the church age, we read in Isaiah 65 about the age uh, to die expanding. In other words, we might be approaching the kind of lifespans that were common before the flood, such as Methuselah and Adam himself at age 960 dying at the end, Methuselah 969 years. Uh, all those folks, we we see that this interesting notion that the man who dies at a hundred, just at a hundred, is a, considered accursed. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that they are not, um, there aren't wicked people or unregenerate people at that time as we're entering that age. But that to die so young is indicative that the blessings of God didn't fall upon you. And we said this last time uh, that there's a distinction being made in Goshen. Uh, between what happened to the Egyptians on the one hand and the Israeli slaves on the other, for the first several curses or plagues, they shared them in common. But then there came a point in time where God made a division and said, the curses are going to stop right at this border. And from that point on, the curse will not strike Israel. So God can make distinctions when he wants to. But that's an important point. But yes, uh, as the gospel continues to transform, then all it's like the old saying, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. So, too, the benefits that the gospel brings to a culture benefits uh, Christian and non-Christian alike. Uh, now, it's not an eternal benefit, but it is a temporal benefit. And the scriptures speak to this a lot. And that's not to say that we don't have a, uh, an eternal judgment at the tail end for someone who remains unregenerate and stiff-necked until the end of life. Uh, when they're called home, you know, it's point for men once to die and then the judgment. That judgment is uh, inviolable and cannot be evaded by men. So, <laughs> uh, Zachary, answer your question. Actually, we'll answer that. Um, we actually deal with the question, why is it that uh, we have this notion of surveillance? It's because uh, the scripture says, the eyes of the Lord uh, run through all, the whole earth. And the whole point of surveillance is, of course, for the the state to become godlike in its powers. In order to control everything, you have to know everything. And the premise of Marxist control is to know. The reason that Marxism fails so colossally in Russia is that they try to predict in advance what people's needs are going to be. And that's why the thing that is needed has a shortage and there are nothing there at the store. And the thing that they decided to to manufacture because they thought they needed it is overstocked. So there's no toilet paper, but there's plenty of Michael Bolton CDs. That's the kind of thing that you you get in in Russia because only the market actually knows everything, if you will. Uh, And it's an abstract structure of the billions of things going on simultaneously, transactions. Uh, to understand this at the humanistic level, you could read von Mises' Human Action. It goes into some considerable detail on, on how this works out economically. But you cannot control unless you know, and you cannot know unless you observe. And so 
um, do you have to become godlike in your knowledge, omniscience? And this is what the notion of having all this surveillance is about, or William surveillance, as Zachary calls it. And I'm not sure it necessarily blasphemes the Holy Spirit. It simply is indicative that man need, uh, looks to a god, in this case, humanistic god, this god of the state, to deliver all these blessings, and it cannot deliver these blessings and says, well, I need to have to be the god that you want. I need to know everything. I need to know what's in your bank account, what's on your browser, on your computer, and uh, where you're going, uh, GPS-wise. And we're going to have uh, dash cams on every police car and da and um, show you know, personal body cams on every policeman. And here in Austin, there are the halo, high-altitude uh, uh, cameras all over the main city, so they can always uh, and they're always observing everything that's going on. That's because the state is becoming like a god. And that's its intention to become a false god and to supplant the true god. When God is the capital G, God is the true god, you don't need all of these things. They are the accoutrements, the elements of a false god stretching its muscles and flexing its, its wings, if you will. And that's what we see today. Let's see, there was a question by Super C, so I promised I would get to... Martin, what is Chalcedon's stand on the new covenant grace and covenant law? This is how it normally separates in churches. Um, I guess what we're talking about is uh, some of the, the notions that only the um, the deprecation ultimately of the Old Testament, of Old Covenant law. And this is, in fact, does split churches, <laughs> of course. Uh, it splits seminaries, and it's creating a big divide um, between even Christian leaders. And it come, boils down to this, from Hosea 8.12, and I, re, I quote this a lot, it looks like every other message I quote this, where God says, I wrote unto Ephraim concerning the marvelous things of my law, but they were esteemed by him a strange thing. So insofar as we regard the law of God as a strange thing, as an alien thing um, that has no part to play in our lives, uh, we will not observe any of the benefits, the marvelous things that God put in there for us. Uh, and that creates a vacuum. And I think one of the appeals of this is now we're going to have this very vague spirituality instead, uh, premised on the Holy Spirit and being guided by the Spirit, uh, as if the Holy Spirit was completely incompatible with the law of God, uh, and, and the two things were at some kind of war, which is impossible since the law of God represents the character of God himself and the Holy Spirit, of course, is the third person of the Trinity. So there is no conflict between these things. But we routinely see the setting aside of the law of God in place of a new ethical standard for Christians. And this new ethical standard differs very, very little, unfortunately, from uh, total lawlessness. But what happens is that we've made our... Uh, antinomianism acceptable by trying to paper it over uh, with massive amounts of theological reasoning and very, very um, profound uh, verbiage. Uh, some of it sounds uh, quite inspiring until you realize that it's advocating the setting aside of Scripture. If and one of the big things that it really is uh, in violation of is the notion that uh, every scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and training in righteousness for the man of God. Uh, their view is, no, not anymore. No, we, we have a better way. And this notion of a better way is always a worse way because it's now at this point it's no longer God's way. It pretends to be God's way, and because, just because you have theologians adopting something or promoting it does not make it right. And what's scary is that when they hold these positions of authority, they use those positions of authority uh, as a blockade, an obstacle for critical review. And they therefore fall back on their authority uh, and say that that's sufficient and adequate for us to accept them. And then they can also argue that you know, anyone who disagrees with them obviously don't, didn't study it as hard as they did. And that's why it's very rare to get debates on these topics. And uh, for people even to follow the debate, usually what happens when the debates happen is that uh, both uh, sides who are watching the debate think their side won. So everyone is simply reinforcing their existing biases, confirmation bias. The debates don't do much good for us. 
So I think God's going to sweep all of this aside because the one thing that's going to stand the test of those who build their lives on the Word of God and on the entirety of the law of God. You see, the second that you don't proclaim the whole counsel of God, I don't think that you can make good on the protest that Paul puts in the motion, says, you know, that I, I am guiltless of the blood of any man. Why do you say he was guiltless of the blood? Because having failed or shunned to proclaim unto you the whole counsel of God. If he had left any parts out, then, of course, it's possible that he would have left sin on the heads of the people he was speaking to. But he did not leave anything out. He proclaimed the entirety of the counsel of God that was relevant to these folks, uh, to their needs, and to their problems, and to their futures, and to their souls, and their eternal souls, and their destiny. And he spoke to it without fear. And nowadays, we, we want to, it's almost as if we uh, have the opposite view of, say, the American Revolution. Um, folks who, who set in motion the Declaration of Independence, uh, we want to say, let's not rock the boat, let's essentially endorse the existing status quo for the state. And therefore the state can stay this big monster god with all these authorities that it's not allowed to have. Uh, here's a case in point, I think it's huge, if, if you follow me. Rushduni correctly, in my view, says that the civil government is to be supported strictly by the half-shekel of silver per male head of household tax uh, found in uh, Exodus 30. Uh, and uh, that is a very, very teeny amount. It's 11,000 times smaller than what we're spending on civil government today in America for all the civil governments we've done. So the second you say, let's set aside this this law of God that is um, you know, would just create um, all sorts of tyranny, Mm -mm. You are now extracting, I, I, I worked it out, it's about $69,000 is being spent every year um, for every American family, this is on average, uh, in order to uh, have this governmental structure in place that if you were to replace that with the biblical size government, 11,000 times smaller, which is hardly tyrannical if it's that teeny, uh, and it's premised on Christian self-government dominating finally, and decentralization occurring, uh, that's a lot of money to extract from every single Christian household, $69,000. It could have gone for things that you, as a Christian family, as head of household, could see to. But instead, you're going to give that to the state, and the state's going to then give you back a, a load of grief. And a very, very teeny amount of that's going to actually be anything practical that you can use. It's because it's inherently inefficient, and it's inherently unbiblical. Uh, insofar as that the government was to be set up according to the pattern that God gave us, and that pattern does not allow for such massive states and massive state funding. And so once you eradicate and you snip that scripture out and say, no, 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 that had nothing to do with civil government, uh, we actually published a series of articles by Dr. Robert Fugate. This was a couple of years ago, but there were three. It was a long enough a series that we had to run it across three issues of Faith for All of Life, and Ground Control might be able to find them. It seems that we post them every other month here on these Q&As because the question keeps coming up. What's the proper size of biblical government, civil government? Very, very teeny. And because there's no money for anything other than teeny, because that's all that God is providing. Uh, God provides for social financing through the poor tithe. He, he provides for health and education through the Levitical tithe. He uh, provides for the families to rejoice and have vacations on the rejoicing tithe. And the civil government is covered by this much smaller piece which is the half shekel, which works out to, for um, America, that I worked it out in 2015, $548 million at the time based on what silver cost. And that was, we had over $13.8 trillion of all our state and federal governments combined together. Uh, so that is a difference of 11,000 nearly. And that difference is the difference between being a slave and being a free man under God in America. And we've chosen slavery, and you're getting a belly full of it. And until you start to reconstruct that, you're going to be in the same boat for a long, long time. Because these, uh, it's very difficult to roll back all of these benefits because people, and when you have a, a resource, capital resource, at uh, zero cost, then demand goes to infinity, to, you know, supply and demand. And that's a problem because people become slaves to their appetites. And uh, Ecclesiastes has an interesting phrase for that. You know, a hunger for silver cannot be satisfied by silver. In other words, it is insatiable. 
And so once you're on the government teat, you have an insatiable appetite. And it takes a Christian character a transformation at the Christian level to finally say, no, I'm going to actually be responsible for myself and my own family. And I'm going to have to break some of these, uh, ob um, what would I call them, chains, literally, um, burst these chains that I've uh, gladly put on my back because I didn't know any better. But now as a Christian and taking the whole counsel of God, I see different. And then you start to build that new situation in the middle of your enemies. You know, that's what David talks about, maybe in the midst of his throat, uh, foes. Let's see some questions popped up. Uh, note, uh, all those in California, right, Christian Reconstruction Meetup will be taking place in Los Altos, California, August 10th to 11th. And there's a link that uh, they provided. Hello, Roberto. Head tax, thank you. Actually, I uh, Shelby, I do not I have not I do not watch uh, television, so I could not tell you what uh, anything about The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, I gather that shows like this, which show a tremendous um, dystopia, where women are become totally objectified and used, um, are essentially various orphan children of Nathaniel Hawthorne's work with the Scarlet Letter, basically. Um, and this, the fact that they have a double standards for the men and the women. And so he's the great-grandfather of all these things that have then come down to the pike since then, including uh, notions like this. And it is common in modern Hollywood to say the big, it used to be this, the big enemy was always the businessman. Uh, <laughs> Paul Lyons used to say, he said, you know, I'm watching all these TV programs and movies, and 98% of the time, the bad guy is a businessman. So we never see a businessman reflected in a positive sense. A corporation is always the evil entity, period. Uh, and so um, you create this intrinsic cultural war um, by this depiction. But now we've also said, let's make fundamentalist Christians the enemy. We can start back with uh, uh, the Scopes trial things um, and making hay out of these kind of cultural issues and then you create a fictional world where the enemy is of course the fundamentalist looking Christian the evangelical Christian uh, especially if he holds any kind of notion of biblical law they will present a very distorted picture of it uh, which we ourselves would also say that's not what we we're holding to but they're going to then paste that label on us and then say see that's what happens if you let these folks uh, into any kind of power. So let's make sure they don't get anywhere close to picking Supreme Court justices or doing this or that or the other or having any influence. Let them keep this horrible, regressive, retrograde religion of theirs uh, in the closet at home where it's far, far away from public view and public access. And so, yes, there's always a battle plan behind what Hollywood is putting out there. There is never a neutral position in any kind of program that Hollywood puts out. They have an X to grind. That X is going to be either anti-business in the old style, or it's going to be anti-Christian, uh, the new enemy, if you will. Uh, and that's the way we have to expect that, and we have to then understand that. And perhaps one thing we should also consider doing is not to help fund it. <laughs> so uh, it makes sense to say, why would I want to do that? And I think that would then, then would say, why would the sponsors say I want to do such and so? Now, I'm not normally a big fan, uh, in fact, generally not a fan of um, notions of worldly weapons, including boycotts. However, to fund your own overthrow does not make a lot of sense to me. Uh, it, 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 it's maniacal. It is psychotic, and I think we need to stop it. It's possible that there was a book review, yeah. Of the Hawthorne book, yes. Yeah, there's the link. Oh, of course, it was. Yeah, Shelby's right. She says the premise was based on Christian Reconstructionism, and this is where the book by McVicker is very interesting because when McVicker wrote his book, he did a lot to reroute our understanding of Christian Reconstructionism at the secular level. He was telling those folks, you know, you you got this all wrong. You got Rush completely wrong. You're misunderstanding what his strengths are, what his weaknesses are. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we have the link provided by Ground Control. Uh, it's, it's a typical situation. That's all we can say.
Uh, but yeah, McVicker did a great job, uh, and even then the book had some errors in it and, and some, some casual sloppy things, which we've drawn his attention to after it posted, and which he will probably fix if he gets to a second edition. So uh, McVicker, who is not a Reconstructionist, tried to do right by what Rush Dooney and his impact on culture truly was versus what people claim it is. Um, you don't should not let someone's enemies define them for you. You should def- be able in a position to define yourself. All right, man, Ground Control gave us something else. Charles Roberts, good to have you back in the saddle. Good to have you here. Uh, we were praying for you uh, through last week. Uh, can Ground Control tell me what time it is? Because I don't know how much time we have left, because uh, this time the uh, the timer is absent on my feed. About one out of four sessions, I can actually see what time it is, and the rest of the time I'm operating blind. So let's see if we have, like, Three minutes left or ten minutes left, and that will determine whether I take more questions. Four minutes. Well, I do want to remind you folks, do support Calcedon uh, if you have opportunity to do so. Uh, the work that we do is uh, limited by what we receive, and uh, we certainly want to stretch our wings and expand the work that's going on. There's, uh, If you are not aware of it, there's a new book series that's imminent, going to hit uh, the press soon. Uh, I'm hopeful that we might actually have copies as early as October. It depends on the printing process. But Faith in Action, a massive three-volume set of all of Calcedon, the Rush uh, um, papers, other than the position papers. And again, a massive index, just like In Informed Faith had. A critical, very important book, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to see it coming out. Talk about a, a set of tools for the uh, Christian to use to know what to do. Uh, there it lays it out. So... That's going to be coming up later this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing that released and seeing the effect of that when that seed is planted, people then having the benefit. Some of these things have never um, appeared except in the magazine, and then if you weren't subscribed in 1988 or 89, you never saw it. And are bringing these things back to light because there was a limitation to what was available in Roots of Reconstruction. And that limitation is now we blow the doors off of that and have the entirety of Dr. Rush Tooney's writings available. So, apart from his commentaries and his major books that you already see online at calcedon.edu, we have the benefit of all of his uh, writings that are not position papers. The position papers are, papers are all in an informed faith. That filled three volumes. Now we have three slightly larger volumes for uh, faith in action. So, that's going to be an exciting thing. Yeah, Charles, we're definitely looking forward to that, too. Again, we have a... Um, Book of the Month Club. It's interesting if, if you saw uh, the announcement at Calcedon.edu's um, Facebook page. We've had some, um, you could say, mild trolling from folks who said, well, maybe there's a mythology of science, but certainly the Book of Islam and the Bible are 100% mythology. And some folks took umbrage at it that we we're being trolled. Well, that's the problem on Facebook, is that uh, all we get all types. And some people are seekers, some people are genuine, some people are just want to... Uh, put a sharp stick in your eye. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. We appreciate those who uh, uh, support what we do and like where we're going. We want to continue the work uh, and, and do so in earnest. Keep those questions coming. Again, if you want to send questions in advance to get to those first, uh, that would be uh, ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. And uh, we get those and accumulate them. I print them out just before um, an hour or so before broadcast and have a look at them. Yeah, sometimes I get a little advance notice, and it allows me to pull a link up for advantages. Yes, some of the best trolls can become converts, that's for sure. <laughs> and then we have to train them to stop trolling the other side, because now we have a better way. Um, in fact, uh, the whole point of being winsome is kind of an important point. Uh, sad to say, a lot of Christians who should know better troll one another, uh, particularly on Facebook. And I pray for that to change. It's a matter of character and maturity. And that does come. Uh, I wish it would come sooner, but it will ultimately come. And then those folks uh, can teach the younger generation, saying, don't make the mistakes I made when I was on social media. It was brand new at the time, and everyone got zealous, and everyone had was saving face. And you need to be willing to um, take it on the chin. It's the glory of a man to overlook an offense. And if you can operate using that principle on Facebook, you'll do well, and God can use you. All right, we'll see everyone next week. I will be back in the saddle again. We regret that we missed last week, uh, but we'll be there coming up, and we should sustain continuous Q&As up to the time I take vacation and relax a little bit this year. Thanks, all. It was a great episode. Well, if you say so, I never know 
and some feel good to me, some don't. Just one of those things. So I assume the Lord's going to use whatever I said that's a value and whatever I said was weak, then God's going to have to add to it uh, through conviction and better Bible study on part of my listeners. Because what we want to do is direct everyone to the Word and drive us back to the law of God. That's the only place where there's any safety. That's the rock to build on. Not on Chalcedon, not on your pasture, but on the Word of God itself. We'll talk to you all next week. God bless. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Selbretti. We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit chalcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in all that you do.